Hello and welcome to Northland. We're so glad you've joined us this weekend, whether you're here with us in person or online. In fact, we want to give a special shout out to the Ponce Inlet Home Church, Bridges of America, and the Seminole County Correctional Facilities. When you walked in today, you were handed a worship guide. And if you're online, the link to that is in the chat. This is a resource to help you engage with today's service. This guide includes today's scripture passage, a Bible study, upcoming events, and our latest financial update. It's all there, so check it out. Now this may be your first time at Northland. Welcome. We would love the opportunity to meet you and you can grab someone with an orange lanyard to let them know you're new, or you can simply text us by texting the word Northland to 97,000 to get started. Now, it is good to be together on this Memorial Day weekend as we honor and remember those who have died serving in the United States military. We are grateful for their service and sacrifice to this nation. Now, today we are gathered as we are every weekend to worship God for who he is and what he has done. And he has done a lot at Northland lately. In fact, it's an exciting season as we, as we honor the past and look forward to the future God has for us. And as we look forward, one of the things you've likely heard about is our Raise the Roof Giving Weekend on June 11th and June 12th. You'll hear more about this later today from Pastor Josh, but there's plenty of information on our website, so check it out. Now, speaking of giving, Local Serve Day is another way we get to live generously here at Northland. If you have never been part of Serve Day before, I'd encourage you to sign up for a project. This is a time when we come together as a church family and are sent out to bless the community. This past Serve Day, I actually got to participate in the Writing to Missionaries project. And it was a powerful experience, getting to know, pray for, and encourage our partners all over the world. So consider joining us for our upcoming Serve Day on Saturday, June 4th. And last but not least, Vacation Bible School for children entering first through sixth grade is less than one month away. Your child will have the opportunity to deepen their faith and make some meaningful friendships. Spots are still available, so consider signing up your child or inviting someone you know with a first through sixth grader. Today we are continuing in our series called Transitions as we unpack and process the twists and turns that life can sometimes throw at us. Now would you stand as we worship God for his faithfulness? As we navigate the dry and barren times of our life, we know that God is near and will clear the way forward according to his will and purposes.
stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power.
never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. And that's what we declared, Lord. That you never stop working. Even when we cannot see it, even when we don't feel it, you're working. And I know our country, it's, it's hurting from the tragedies of the last few weeks. Those in Buffalo, those in Uvalde, they're, they're saying, Lord, where were you? Lord, aren't you good? Do you exist? And we as the people of God, we are declaring this truth, not, not because we, just, we, we have just thought it up and we've imagined it. No, it's in your word that even when we don't see it, you're working. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. Because what we can actually do, Lord, we know this, that we can look back over 2,000 years ago and see that you were working when you slayed your son on the cross for the sin of the world. And how in three days he rose from the dead, you're working. And we know, and we know that Jesus has declared that he has gone to prepare a place for us. And if it were not so, he would not have told us. And so Jesus is working. He's building us a, a new city. The new Jerusalem that we know will one day we believe because it is written in your word that one day that new city will fall out of heaven prepared as a bride for her husband. And in that city, there will be no more sickness. There will be no more disease. There will be no more violence. There will be no more mass shootings. There will be no more death for the former things have passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. So even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it, you're, you're working. You're working. And you never stop working. And we live and we press hard into that truth. It's in Jesus', our King's name, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Northland. It is so good to be with you. I am now officially here full time. It's amazing. I'll, uh, now, I'll, I'll make it legal this week. I'll, I'll go get a driver's license and license plate that says Florida on it. And I'm definitely not looking forward to paying money to, to do that, but I am here nonetheless, and I could not be more grateful to be here. So, hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. You can turn your Bible on, whatever you, you, whatever you do. Now, let me give a couple of shout outs to Pastor Gus and Governing Elder Vince Taylor for the last couple of weeks of knocking it out of the park in our series, Transitions. Yeah, give them... Love those two men, so grateful for them. Now, as I think about now being here permanently, this past week was the big move. The, the truck pulled up, started to load our stuff up, and now the truck is headed down here. But when I think about the last couple of months, there have been a lot of changes. Like uh, over a month ago, the people who were going to buy our house, they pulled out kind of last minute. And so Joni and I, we were like, oh my gosh, we've got to now get our house ready to put on the market because it was never put on the market. And so within a period of about 12 hours, this is what Joni and I did. We, we completely cleaned our house, we decluttered everything, and we got it ready to put on the market. Look at what an amazing job I did. I mean, I did, you know. <laughs> yeah, you guys who are laughing, you know I didn't do that. Uh, I, I said, Joni, what do you want me to do, baby? What do you want me to do? I'm here to please you. I'm here to serve you. And that's what, that's what I was doing. But, but that, was, that was it. Now, I, I, can't, I can't even tell you how many times uh, I, I ran to Goodwill, too. As we were decluttering, uh, we would load up the car. I'd go to Goodwill, and they're like, you want a receipt for this? I'm like, no, just please take it off my hands. Does it work? I don't know, but here you go. And then I can't tell you how many items we put on Facebook Marketplace. And when we would put things on Facebook Marketplace, our, our kids have like this warped concept of what you charge on Facebook Marketplace. Because we would put something on for like a hundred bucks and like, why are you putting it on for a hundred, you know, or a hundred dollars? Well, we paid $500 for it. 
like 10 years ago. And they're like, oh, well, well, you know. Or if we put something on for $25, oh my gosh, you could get, you could get $75 for that. No, you can't. Back in 1980, you might have could, but not now. I mean, it was just weird. It, it was fun. So as we decluttered, as we got rid of things, as we sold things, but then, but then it came time to pack up. And then we started to pack boxes and this is what our house began to look like. Now, I, I'll just be honest. I don't know if you saw my little sermon teaser this, this past week, but I was tired. I was, I was wore slap out. I, I, didn't want, I didn't want to have to, to construct another box and tape it up and put things in it. I, I was done. I was telling Joni, I can't do it, baby. I got to go to bed. And it was like eight o'clock. I'm like, I, I, I'm, I'm, done. I'm done. So, so I, I, think, I think we've all been there. I, I think we've all probably moved at some point so you can identify with the transition. Now, where we're going this morning, though, as I was thinking about like, like the Laxton transition, I mean, it's just five people moving from Wheaton, Illinois to Longwood, Florida. So even then, it's still stressful, it's emotional, it's taxing. But could you imagine trying to manage a move of a million plus people? Of, of taking them from Egypt to the promised land. And, and some scholars believe it's up to almost two million people. Could you imagine that move? You know what emoji comes to my mind when I think of that kind of move? <laughs> like, no sir, no thank you. And so what I want to do this morning, and it probably will be one of the most important, if not the most important message that I will preach in this series, and I want to talk about church transitions. I want to talk about corporate transitions. Now, maybe some of you are business people. Maybe some of you, you are principals or a teacher at a school that is in desperate need of a transition. And right now, we are actually in the midst of a cultural transition. And so these principles that we will look at this morning, they can apply to any corporate transition, but I'm applying them specifically to the church. Now, let me start by sharing some principles of corporate or church transitions right off the bat. Community transitions not only require managing the change, but also helping people process the change. Like I'll give you a, an example. I, as you could imagine, our, our kids, this has been a, a not an easy move for them. Now they have not rebelled. They, they have not like taped themselves to their bed and like, I'm not moving, so nothing like that. But I, but I remember a couple of months ago when this was a done deal, I was on a trip with my oldest, Caleb. And, and, he, had, and, and, and he had some ties to, to Wheaton and he, he was really bummed. And here's what I told him. I said, Caleb, like it is okay to be upset. It is okay to grieve. It is okay to be mad because there is a loss. But in the next sentence, I said, so while I want you to grieve and while I want you to express what you are feeling, here's one of the things I'm going to ask you to do in processing this transition. I want you to start thinking about and writing down what you are hopeful for. That you're asking God that he would do this in this new season. You say, Josh, why are you, why are you sharing that? Because I could have, for, for my 16-year-old and 14-year-old and 10-year-old, I could have said, hey, you need to put your big boy pants on and you just need to get with the program. We're moving to Florida. But what I would have been doing at that point was dragging them to Florida. What I wanted to do is I wanted to lead them to Florida. See, when it comes to church transitions, I don't want to drag you into the future just where God's leading us. No, I wanna, I wanna help you process the transition psychologically of where God is leading us. And I hope and pray that every single person in this room, the people that were at the 9 a.m. and the people that were at the 5 p.m. and everybody who would consider themselves part of the Northern community online, I want to be a conduit that helps you process where God's leading us, not just dragging you. The second principle is this, community transitions that do succeed have a strong anchoring center that keeps people focused throughout the process. 
Like if you're gonna have an effective transition, corporate transition, you need to have an anchoring presence and purpose that keeps everybody focused. Because if not, you'll have vision drift, which we'll see this morning. And then third, and this is a really strong principle, community transitions usually come at a price many people don't want to pay. There are not a lot of books out there that contain a lot of success stories of churches making the transition, of not making a good transition, a successful transition. Now you do remember the five options that we have when it comes to transitions. We can, there's the stop mode, the survive mode, then there's the stuck mode, then there's the merely functioning mode, and then there's the flourishing mode. Most corporate community church transitions never get to the fifth. They never get to flourishing in their transition. How many of you remember Blockbuster? They didn't make that transition. Blackberry didn't make the transition. And I could give you business after business, like I'm saying. Like e even corporate transitions, not, not all the businesses make it, and most of them don't make it because they're not willing to pay the price. Now, like I said, I'm not gonna be talking about business and culture and all of that, but, but, but I will say this once again, that these principles do hold true there. I'm going to be applying this to the church. Now, in general, the church in North America is at a crossroads, a transitional point in our history. Well, over the majority of the churches are in decline right now. Over 60% of the churches in North America are in decline. Church attendance has been declining for decades, and even the faithful who are attending gatherings, they're doing so less frequently. Most of the churches that are growing, they are doing so from transfer growth, meaning some people left one church and they have scooted their boot to the next church right down the street. And that's how most churches are growing. Only a few churches in North America are growing through conversion growth. Well, what does that mean? Only a few churches, only a handful of churches are reaching people far from God. Additionally, the church in North America finds herself in a post-Christian culture, an uber and hostile post-modern culture where there is no truth. However, if your truth isn't their truth, you know what they do? They have the audacity to cancel you. So they're not, really a, they're not really receptive to other people's truth. And what they'll do is that they'll intimidate you in canceling you so that you can come and join their truth. And then we are now about to enter a post-COVID world that has changed the habits of people. And it's definitely changed the habits of church people and church models and practices and even attendance. Furthermore, churches may find themselves in a season of transition unique to them. Things such as leadership transition, moral failings. I mean, every single week, it seems like another high profile person who's been a church leader or pastor has fallen from grace. There's been lots of changes and transitions in churches due to a host of factors. Friction, factions, div division over decisions, national politics, race, etc. Such changes, has led to what sociologist Ann Swidler calls a shift from settled to unsettled times. Well, what does settled times mean, Josh? Well, it means the familiar. It's the comfortable. It's the season of life where you have a routine and a rhythm. You're settled. Unsettled means that you are uncomfortable. You're confused. Life is difficult. You're tired. You're, you're, you're trying to understand things. It's unsettled. And that's where the church is, in an unsettled time, but it's unsettled times where the hard work of processing, orienting, and navigating the change happens. That's the hard work. Now for the church, as we find ourselves in unsettling times, we should be doing the hard work by asking questions like, how do we transition from the previous cultural context into the new cultural context? How do we transition from decline to growth, from stagnation to multiplication, from division to unity, from an inward focus to an outward focus? How do we transition from merely existing as a church to fully engaging in the mission of God? That's the hard work of processing the change. And so, as, as we process this transition, 
Another question that I'm asking myself as the lead pastor is how do I make sure I lead, I care for, and I bring along as many people as possible to make the transition? Because like I said just a few moments ago, I don't wanna bring you kicking and screaming. And here's how, you wanna know how we're gonna do that? Okay, here's how. We gotta have a goal for the transition. We gotta have something, what are we shooting for? And so with that in mind, here's the main point that we will flesh out for the remainder of our time this morning, that the goal of community corporate church transitions is to move a church body from here to there in a manner that transforms everyone more into the image and likeness of Jesus who fully engages in the mission of God. That's the goal. And, you, and you're probably saying, well, what, what was the goal for Israel of moving from Egypt to the promised land? Was it something similar? Absolutely. So as God delivers and saves Israel out of Egypt, he is taking them to the promised land. Now on the way, on the journey, he gives them commandments. He gives them laws. And those commandments and those laws were to govern life in the land. And as they would live under the rule and reign of God, as they would live under his law and his commandments, they would be shaped as the people of God. And then in Exodus 19, here's what we read. It's basically the mission statement for Israel. And here's what God says. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all of the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, here's what's so interesting about that word kingdom of priest. You know what a priest did back then? A priest mediated between God and people. So now as God is moving Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, and he's given them commandments and laws that will govern how they live, then what they want, what God wants from Israel is that as they live under his rule and reign, that they would act as a nation, as a priest mediating between God and the surrounding nations so that they might declare God's glory among the nations. So that was the goal of the transition from Egypt to the promised land. You say, well, what's our promised land, Josh? Well, man, I'm glad that you asked. So here's our promised land. Our promised land is Revelation 21, 22. One of these days, Jesus will come back a second time and he will consummate, he will culminate his kingdom here on planet earth. And it's in that kingdom, there will be no more sickness, no more disease, no more death. There will be no more division. There will be no more hostility. There will be no more violence. There will be no more wars for the former things have passed away. Behold, he has made all things new. There will be no poor, marginalized, oppressed. There will be none of that. And we will be his people and he will be our God and we will live forever in the eternity surrounded by the glory of God as we participate in the life of God in all spheres of life. That is where we are headed. And so as we are heading there, guess what he's doing? As he saves us from our sin, what, what Jesus is doing through the power of the Holy Spirit and his word, he is crafting us and conforming us more into his image as we participate in his mission of redeeming a people from all all peoples, every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every people group will have a representative in the kingdom of God. That is where we're going. And so between here and there, it's what scholars refer to as the already but not yet kingdom, meaning we're just getting glimpses of what's coming. We're just getting glimpses. So we're making this transition. And so as a church, here, that is the transition we're in. So any micro transition that we ever will have is in that big macro transition of moving towards the new city, Jerusalem. But what we will see this morning, particularly with Israel, is how people try to stop those transitions and how people get stuck in those transitions. And we're gonna look at five saboteurs. Everybody say saboteur. That is a fun word. I even enjoy writing that word. It's five saboteurs 
that prevent people from moving towards the promises and the purposes of God. So with that said, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? So Numbers chapter 14, we'll look in verses 26 and following. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? Keep in mind, this is his community that he saved. But wicked community, I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land that I swore with uplifted hand to make your home except Caleb and Joshua. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land that you've rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. And and look at this. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land and you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. Think about that. God against his own people. Not against Egypt. Not against the Amalekites, not against the Amorites, but the Israelites. You will know what it's like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community which has banded together against me. They will meet their end in this wilderness. Here they will what? Father, may you be glorified. Jesus, may we point to you in spirit. May you move in a powerful way that you will transform us more into the image of Jesus, that we might be a church more in line to where you are taking us than where we want to be going. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right. So here we go. Five saboteurs of church transitions. Now, I want you to keep in mind, this is so important to keep in mind, that we are only about a month or two into the journey Like in other words, just a month or two prior to this is when God delivered them out of Egypt. So we're not not too far into it. And what we're going to see in these five saboteurs is just mind boggling. So saboteur number one, freezing fear, freezing fear. And here's the principle, fear freezes us from following God's will. So the context is that, like I said, about a month or two into the journey, uh, they get about 10, 20 miles from the promised land, from the land of Canaan. And God tells Moses, hey, I want you to send 12 spies into the land to spy it out and to come back and report. So for 40 days, these 12 spies, they're in the land. They're looking at all of the inhabitants in the land. They're collecting fruit from the land. And now they come back to the community. And the first part of their report, they're like, oh my gosh, the land is amazing. It is flowing with milk and honey. The fruit is out of this world. Here's some of the fruit. Hey man, take some of these grapes. These are awesome. It's so good. It's so good. But the second part of the report is we can't attack them. So it's so good, but we can't go. That, that's what 10 of the 12 spies say. They say, we can't attack those people. Now, I, I know I say can't a little, a little southernness, you know, that, that's fine. Like, we can't, we, we can't attack those people. That, that's what I want to say. Like, we, we can't. Now, we'll get to the reason why they utter that sentence, we, we can't attack these people. But just for a moment, I want, I want to hone in on the statement, we can't attack. Because basically what they're saying is that we fear We fear, therefore, we can't go. We fear, therefore, we can't go. We fear, we can't go. We fear the promise isn't worth the pursuit. We fear the fruit isn't worth the fight. We fear the command isn't worth the campaign. We fear the mission isn't worth the movement. We fear the call isn't worth the cost. We fear, thus, we can't. God, I mean, and this is what is mind-boggling. God told them to go. 
It's not about we can, it's about that he can. And they, and, and they took their eyes, they took their mind off of that. They weren't willing to fight for and possibly die for what God wanted. Let me ask you this, I mean, that, that's the ultimate thing, is that God had saved them out of Egypt. He had purchased them, he had redeemed them. They were no longer their own, they were bought with the price, and that is what the New Testament teaches of us. When Jesus saved us, we were bought with a price that's not our own. So if Jesus, and that's the reason why, anyone who's willing to come after Jesus must deny himself, take up his cross and follow him. Listen, at the end of the day, if his call is a call to die, we go because he said. But yet they're preserving their life. They're preserving their life, they're preserving their wives' life, they're preserving their children's life, and therefore their fear says we can't. Now, Caleb, He silences the people and says, we can and we should. See, Caleb and Joshua wanted to pursue God's promise. The others wanted to preserve their life. Let me ask you this, what are you afraid of in transitions? See, when it comes to church transitions, I I cannot tell you how many times I've heard general statements. Now, I haven't heard these statements out of Northland. And here's the thing, to be honest, like, I, I, have, I have not seen any of these saboteurs present in my two months here. So here's the thing. I'm not preaching this message in a way to step on your toes of what's happening. I'm just giving you this because this is what can happen if we're not careful in this transition. But I cannot tell you how many times I've heard general statements come out of church people's mouth when it came to try and reach people far from God are trying to discern the best way to minister to people. I've heard things like, we can't because we never have. So they fear change. We came because people will leave. They fear loss. We came because it makes me uncomfortable. They fear discomfort. We came because it costs too much. They fear the cost. We came because I don't want to, because they fear the loss of control. And you see what I found, not only in research, but experience, the we can'ts ultimately are attempting to preserve a history, maybe the good old days, a tradition, a personal preference, their friend's feelings, their comfort, and their understanding. And and, and can I just say this too? Whatever you try to preserve or protect reveals the idols in your life. See, that's what was going on with Israel. Their lives became an idol. Their children, their wives became an idol. And so therefore they said, we cannot enter into a fight. We cannot go into the land. And and let me also share this. When it comes to what local churches should fight for, do you know know the three things that they should fight for? Here's the three things that they should fight for. Number one, they should fight for the centrality of Jesus in all things. The second thing that they should fight for is for the souls that are far from Jesus. And then the third thing churches should fight for is for the unity in the body. That's the three things. And that is what the governing elders and I have been tasked with, that those will be the three things that we fight for. And if we find anybody, and again, I'm not saying that we have, but we will not fight over secondary and tertiary matters that doesn't really mean the hill of beans to what God has called us to do. And so it's not about preserving out of fear what we want, but pursuing in faith what God wants. So that's saboteur number one. Saboteur number two, faulty focus, faulty focus. So we see at the end of verse 31, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And then later on, we see all the the people we saw there are of great size. And then in verse 33, we read, we seem like grasshopper, grasshoppers in our own eyes and we look the same to them. So they're saying we can't because of who they are. Now, this is the mind boggling part. I wanna go, hello, McFly, McFly. <laughs> like, do you realize who just saved you out of Egypt? 
Do, do, do you remember that that God, he's the one who heard your cry. He's the one who sent a deliverer. He's the one who performed the 10 plagues. He's the one that protected you from the killer plague. He's the one that plundered the Egyptians. He's the one that parted the Red Sea. He's the one who wiped out the Egyptian army. He's the one that provided manna and quail. He's the one that provided water. And he's the one that defeated the Am- Amalekites. And you worried about those people? Hello, McFly. Lord have mercy. But you know what was happening is that on paper, they were looking at who they were and who the inhabitants were. See, if you start looking at things that are written on paper and looking at the facts, yes, you will be overwhelmed, but you are having a faulty focus. I'll give you a, for instance, uh, anybody out there, any Rocky fans out there? Love, I love me Rocky. My favorite Rocky is Rocky IV with Rocky versus, versus Ivan. Now on paper, it's the tail of the tape. Rocky, he's 5'11", 173 pounds, 70 inch reach, and he's 39 years old. I can attest to the 39 part. Now, height, 6'5", of Ivan, 261 pounds, 85 inch reach, and he's 24 years old. On paper, guess who was supposed to win? Ivan. And they, they said, oh, Ivan's gonna take him out in the first, maybe, maybe second, no more, no more than three rounds. Also, I think of the horse that won the Kentucky Derby this year, Rich Strike. Rich Strike, he entered the race 30 seconds before the deadline. He only got into the race because one horse scratched, started from the worst post position on the outside of the track. He had to make his way through the field of 19 other horses. His race career, seven starts, only one win. His jockey had never been to the Kentucky Derby. His trainer had never raced a horse in the Kentucky Derby. His trainer lost two dozen race horses in a barn fire a few years back. Eric Reed lost his two assistants. Last year to cancer, Rich Strike was purchased for a claiming race for last fall for only $30,000 and his odds were 80 to one. Nobody bet on that horse. So when you look at what's on paper, sure, you're gonna be overwhelmed. You see, when I look at what's on paper, I see a culture moving towards a more secular progressive environment and one that is antagonistic towards the Christian faith that exclaims absolute truth. I do see a declining church attendance. I see moral failings in high profile Christians. I see a burnout rate among pastors and church leaders increasing. I see a waning trust in institutions. I see a losing influence in the culture, a fading credibility with the world. I see the political polarization in the church. I see that the church is getting older. Do you know that the average age of a senior pastor today in North America is 54 years old? Well, I see a growing biblical illiteracy in the church. We just don't know what we believe anymore. And I see that we're losing the next generation. On paper, it's overwhelming. But I ain't looking at what's on the paper. (laughs) And neither should you. We should be looking to our God. Last time I checked, he's never failed. Last time I checked... He is 100% victorious. The last time I checked, he's the one that was dead and he came back to life. The last I checked that he has redeemed me, he has saved me, he has set my feet upon a rock, he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise be to our God. That's who I'm gonna look at. And that's who I want to point our church to look at, even when it feels overwhelming. Even when you feel like you, you're tired of moving forward, that you don't want to pack another box, look to him, look to the cross and get your energy and your focus from there. And we must, not, we must be careful of not making the same mistake that the Israelites made, which was creating a perceived reality from the facts that keep us stuck in the present or just leaves us surviving. Because you can create a perceived reality that is not true but it's your perception. So when we go through transition as we are in now, let me ask you this, what are you fixated on? The third, the third saboteur is atrocious attitude. Everybody say atrocious attitude. That's just fun, atrocious attitude. Now here's some principles. Attitudes determine actions, murmuring leads to misery, and complaining is contagious. And so what we see is the Majority of the spies say, we can't attack, they're too big, too strong. And then we see in verse two of chapter 14, all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt. 
or in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to let us fall by the sword? Oh, poor pitiful me. <laughs> and they're grumbling against Moses. Now, when you, when you look at the history, now again, you, I'm trying to keep it in context. They're only a month or two into the journey. And if you go back and read Exodus, here's what you will find. They have complained at least five other times. They've complained when Pharaoh increased their workload. They complained when Pharaoh chased them. They complained about a lack of food. They complained about no water. They complained about their hardship in the wilderness. And now they're complaining again. <laughs> they're living up to their name, children of Israel. Because children definitely know how to complain, right? Now I have three, 16, 14, 10 year old, and there are times where they just, I mean, they just blow us out of the water. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't, we didn't even know you knew how to behave like that. This is amazing. But I will say in this transition, particularly over the last week, there's been a lot of complaining in the Laxton house. Oh my gosh, we have to eat out of these paper bowls and this, this plastic spoon doesn't even hold a lot of milk. Oh my goodness. And we got to live in a suitcase for a week and a half. Oh, we got to stay at BB's house. It's only a one bedroom apartment for a week and a half. Oh my God. I mean, it's just on and on and on and on. <laughs> the whole murmuring leads to misery. So not only is their murmuring reflective of the fact they're miserable, but their constant murmuring made Joni and my life miserable. <laughs> See, when I look at Moses, now the sin of Moses where he struck the rock and didn't speak to it, it prevented him from getting in, into the promised land. But you know in the context, it was, af it, it was after the Israelites were complaining once again. I could imagine being Moses. That's, that's the thing, like, you know, to try to transition a million plus, almost two million people, and they're constantly grumbling, they're constantly complaining, they're constantly wanting to attack you. I mean, I, I, listen, I could completely understand Moses' sin. Lord, I'm just striking the rock so that you can take me out. <laughs> I'm just tired of the murmuring, tired of the complaining. Let me ask you this, are you a complainer, grumbler, or murmurer? Are your words building up tearing down, encouraging and uplifting, or excruciating and exhausting. Ultimately, a complaining mouth is a sign of a calloused heart. A complaining mouth. So teenagers, a complaining mouth is a sign of a calloused heart. Let me ask you this, how's your attitude? How's your attitude? Number four, oh, this, this, this is good. Tell your neighbor, just poke your neighbor and say, this is good. You need to listen. And you need to put your steel toe boots on for this one, all right? So I'm going to warn you. Fourth saboteur is treasonous tactics. Treasonous tactics. Here's the principle. Failing to trust God's plan eventually leads us to rebel against his premacy. So what we have in verse three, they have, they're complaining, Lord, why, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taking this plunder. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And then they say to one another, literally, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. <laughs> what planet are they on? But then Moses and Aaron, along with Joshua and Caleb, they try to reason with the entire assembly saying, hey, listen, why are we going back? God's given us this. Let's go. We can. Let's go in. <laughs> then, in verse 10, you can't make this stuff up. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. <laughs> so you, you see their treasonous tactics, right? They know what's better for them than the Lord does. They reject the leaders that God has placed over them. They talk about committing violence against four people that trust and believe God and their plotting and planning were all in direct violation against the Lord. That's why in verse 23, here's what the Lord says. No one who has ever treated me with contempt will ever see it. You know what that word contempt means? Rebellion. That's why I call it treasonous tactics. Now here's what's sobering. If we were to get in a DeLorean, everybody knows, knows what a DeLorean is, right? Hello, McFly, you know, Emmett Brown, 
DeLorean, Back to the Future. Yeah, if we were getting, if we were going to get into a DeLorean, and we would go back here, and we would talk to these people, and go, what, what, what's going on? Here's what they would say. I, I, I believe with Almar, they would say something like this: Well, we were just doing what we felt was right. Like, well, what's so bad about trying to protect our life? What, what, what's so bad about trying to protect our wives and our children? We, we're just doing what we, we thought was right. Oh, how many times have churches not experienced the flourishing and the promises and the purposes of God because they've been trying to do what was right in their eyes? And when you try to do what's right in your eyes and not God's eyes, that's treasonous. Now, this is where you need your steel toe boots. Now, again, I'm not saying I've seen any of this here, so please hear me. I love you. You have been very receptive to me. You've been very honoring. I, I mean, listen, I, I'm overwhelmed by your generosity and love. So, but I'm telling you this to prevent you from getting there. And then I'm also doing this because you do understand that there are a lot of pastors out there. They don't have the privilege of leaving such a loving and receptive congregation. And so you might want to like and share this for the, for the other pastor in his church that needs to hear these examples. Let me go ahead and get you with these examples. All right, let me give you these examples. Treasonous tactics, here we go. Treasonous tactics, 101 with Pastor Josh, right here. <laughs> Speak truth with vitriol and anger, not love, treasonous tactic. Like if you, don't, if you don't speak truth in love, if you don't speak truth in grace, but you speak truth with vitriol and anger, that's a treasonous tactic. If you rally support and thus create factions, treasonous tactic. Embellish the truth to rally people to your cause, treasonous tactic. Focus on outward signs rather than the inward heart, treasonous tactic. How does that happen, uh, Josh? By who we hire. For one, a lot of times churches are just looking at the most perfect resume so that they can have the most perfect fit for the church. Do you realize that the Lord never hired anybody who had a perfect resume? But yet we live in a culture, we gotta have a perfect resume. And just so that you know this, I didn't have a perfect resume. I didn't. That's one of the reasons why the governing elders and the search committee loved me, is that I, I, came with, I came with baggage, I guess, but I got rid of that baggage. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Listen, I just had some bad church experiences in transition. And so when you look at my resume, you'll go, man, he just never stays in a place long enough. Listen, I. I, I could get into reasons why, but at the end of the day, all of what I'm talking about here, I've experienced it firsthand. We do this by failing to hold leaders accountable. We just look at the outward signs. Oh, where they're growing the church, but their heart's a mess. Treasonous tactic. Cynical and hostile about the culture and world. Treasonous tactic. I got an email, not, not from somebody here. They were looking for a church, but they wanted me to rail against, they wanted me to rail against the government. They wanted me to rail against Disney. They wanted me to rail against uh, uh, sinners. And I said, and, and I, I politely replied in a very political correct. But here's the thing I wanted to tell that person is that the last I checked, we read John three sixteen that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And later on, Jesus says he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world because the world already stood condemned. So I'm not going to rail against the world. I'm going to point them to a loving God who is going to save them from their muck and mire, from their sin. And I'm not, and here's the other, though this is yeah, uh, cynical and hostile about the church. I, I don't know how many times I've heard, well, you know, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, if you become part of it, you'll fit right in. The, the last I checked, we needed a savior. The church doesn't have it all together. I don't have it all together. And so if you're cynical about the church, you'll never be part of the church and you'll sure as heck won't serve the church. And it's a treasonous tactic. Oh, this is, this, this is a good one too. Uh, not serving or giving in any way to the church. What I've experienced in my years is that those who complain the loudest tend to give the least or even nothing. And here, here's a big one. Oh. Blackmail or bribe the church and church leadership by weaponizing money to get what they want. Well, you know, if you ain't gonna do what I want, I just withhold my money. 
That's a treasonous tactic. And the last I checked, the church isn't Congress, so you can't lobby Congress. It is owned by Jesus who spilt his blood. And if you want to weaponize your money against God, gosh, whoo, he'll take your money away. Everybody okay? <laughs> Wearing masks of righteousness, acting as though you have it all together and thus giving the impression to others that they have to have their life together before they become part of the body. Treasonous tactic. You can come just as you are. All, all of your mess, all of your filth, all of your baggage, you can come as you are. And I promise you, we won't have mask of righteousness, or at least this pastor won't. It's a treasonous tactic. Walking around with bitterness, resentment, anger, and thus unforgiveness for something that went down in the past, treasonous tactic. And let me just say it this way for you know, people that might be online. If you leave the church in a bad way, mad, angry, upset, resentful, and you never deal with it, you will take that baggage to the next place and you will undermine them and what God's doing there. And that is a treasonous tactic. And so let me ask you this. Are you engaging in treasonous behavior? And this leads me to the fifth saboteur, and it's this, burdensome baggage. Here's the principles. Own your sin or your sin will own you. We cannot enter God's best bringing our worst, and confession is the pathway to possession. So you might be, maybe some of you might be a little confused. I said, yeah, you come as you are, but here's the thing. You come as you are and you give all of your mess and your baggage to Jesus. Amen. Like there is, there will be no judgment here because we all had baggage when we came to Jesus. But they could not enter the promised land bringing their worst. They could not enter the promised land without confession. Confession is the pathway to possession. Here's, here's the craziness. So God tells Moses to tell them, everybody who's 20 years of age and older, you're not going to get in the promised land. Let that sink in. But you know what these people did? Mind boggling. You know what they did? They're like, well, we, we, we're, we sin. Let's go in and take the land. And Moses is like, no, it's too late, bud. You ain't going in. Oh, no, no, no. We, we got to go in. We, we, we got to go in. Uh, Moses is like, if you go in, it's going to be bad. And you know what they did? They went in. And you know what happened? They got the tail beat. Because, oh, don't, don't miss this church. You cannot go into the promised land bringing the baggage of Egypt. Church, we cannot seize what God has for us if we are bringing the baggage of our sin, our unconfessed sin, and if we have not consecrated and prepared our heart for what God has. We'll never experience his flourishing. We'll never experience his best bringing the baggage of Egypt. So will you stand with me and bow, bow your heads because we're about, to have a, we're about to have a Holy Ghost moment. You ready to have a Holy Ghost moment? Here's the Holy Ghost moment though. This is going to set the stage for June 8th. Everybody say June 8th. June 8th over in the rink, we will have a night of worship and that night of worship will be around repentance, lament, and consecration. Because we want to prepare ourselves for what God has in store and no mind, has conceived of what God has prepared for us. And I believe that. But part of that preparation is confession. Part of that preparation is praise. And so here's what I'm going to invite us to do. This is the Holy Ghost moment. And it might make you a little uncomfortable, but that's okay. I'm gonna open up the altar or you can turn your seat into an altar. And here in the next few moments, if you have a saboteur in your life, that is sabotaging you and could eventually sabotage the church from experiencing God's flourishing, I want you to confess it. 
want you to confess it. I want you to come up here, confess it. If you say, Josh, I don't have a saboteur. Amen, praise God. Here's what you do have, you have praise that you can give and you have a prayer that you can lift up on behalf of Northland. And so if you don't have any saboteurs in your life, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask that you pray for Northland in our transition and that you pray God's flourishing, God's protection, God's presence, God's power. That's what I'm gonna pray. Holy Spirit moment. And let's do it together as a church. Father, have your way in these next few moments. Spirit, work, and move. And it's in your name we pray, amen.
We're gonna stay in that moment. We're gonna stay in that moment as people are still praying, as we're still seeking the Lord. Like I said, I wanted this to, listen, I, I'm not worried about the time, sorry. I'm worried about the Lord moving. Your children will be fine. We got great people back there. And I understand if you, if you, have, to, if you have to leave, you gotta get somewhere, I, I completely understand, but let's sit in, that, let's sit in this moment. The Lord's doing something here at Northland. He's doing something. You see, maybe for the last couple of years, you haven't seen it, you haven't felt it, but he's been working behind the scenes. He's been moving, he's been working. He is prepared, he has been preparing for us such a time as this, where he is awaking a sleeping giant that he will use for his renown and his glory that begins in central Florida and extends to the ends of the earth. And how he's going to do that, you say, how is he going to do that? I would say in five steps. Number one, we are going to be living by the Spirit. We're not gonna be living by fear, but we're gonna be living by faith. That's what we wanna do. Because as we live by the Spirit, we will not desire, we will not gratify the desires of sinful flesh. You know, the second thing that we're going to do, we can read it up here together, let's read it. Step number two, we're gonna focus on pursuing God's flourishing for the future. That's what we're gonna do. I've already painted the preferred future. We're moving towards a new city, new Jerusalem, and we are the body, the people of God that will give a glimpse to the world of the coming reality of the kingdom of God. Here's the third step we're going to do. Let's read it together. We're gonna check your heart so that you can stop your mouth. So we're gonna do that. And you might, you might be around somebody and they wanna talk, all you have to do is gently check your heart. Just check your heart. The fourth step is this, we're gonna ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And Jesus is always going to acknowledge God's presence, his power, Jesus is always going to acknowledge God's faithfulness. And Jesus is always going to acknowledge God's mission, that God is on a mission to redeem a people for himself from every peoples on planet earth to reflect his glory in all spheres of life. And the fifth thing that we'll do as a church is we're gonna prepare your heart for the life change God wants to bring. He's not done changing your life. And he's not done changing people far from him's life. And I'm, that's where I'm saying he, there, there's something stirring here at Northland. You feel it, you sense it, and he's breaking some chains. I know, I know he's breaking chains. Say he's breaking chains. He's breaking chains because when he breaks chains and he lets loose the power of the gospel and the spirit, oh, you just better watch out, just better watch out. Better watch out.
break every chain. The chains of addiction, the chains of depression, the chains of sin, the chains of just merely functioning so that we can flourish. Northern, we are celebrating, you'll probably start hearing this quite a bit as we move into the fall, but we will be celebrating our 50 years of ministry and mission. I truly believe as we begin our next 50, that what we have experienced God doing in the past is just a glimpse and a fraction of what he's yet to do. And if he's done it in the past, guess what he can do? He can do it again in the future. Can he not, church? Let's sing this and we'll be sent out. Here we go. will you receive it Jesus we want what you want we want to move in your direction not a man's direction your direction we want your best we want your flourishing we want to be more conformed into your image and your likeness we want to be more used for your mission among the nations but we know that we cannot do it on our own. We need the Spirit, so we receive the Spirit. We receive your presence. We receive your empowerment to do what the Lord has us here on planet Earth to do. Thank you for this amazing honoring and privilege of serving you, our King. And it's in your name we pray, all God's people said, you are sent out to be the salt and light.